Well, good evening and welcome to tonight's Money Matters workshop on the nuts and bolts of affordable housing. My name is Kimberly Prime, Director of Constituent Services and Community Partnerships for Howard County Executive Calvin Ball. Before we get to our presenters, just a few housekeeping items. Tonight's meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to our Money Matters website for those who are able to join us or if you would like to watch at a later time. You can find this video along with our other Money Matters workshops we will be hosting throughout the month of April at www.howardcountymd.gov slash money matters. During the presentation, if you have any questions, we kindly ask that you place it in the chat box located in the lower right corner of your screen following their presentations. Our speakers will have an opportunity to answer them. At this time, I'm going to turn things over to our first presenter, Peter Engel, Executive Director of the Housing Commission. Good evening and thank you, Kim. Um, we are here tonight to talk about nuts and bolts of affordable housing. Uh, I am, as mentioned, the Executive Director of the Howard County Housing Commission and with me tonight are Donna Sturdivant, who's our Director of Asset Management, and Sam Tucker, the Director of Rental Assistance, and you'll hear a little bit more about what those are as we go along. Um, the Howard County Housing Commission is the housing authority, the public housing authority for Howard County. Uh, housing authorities are separate government institutions. We're not technically part of the county government, uh, and they were established originally in the 1930s to uh, work with public housing, to operate, own and operate public housing. Uh, after that, they began, much, uh, a few years later, began operating the Housing Choice Voucher Program, which used to be called the Section 8 Program and is often still known as that. Uh, and we are a very unusual housing authority in that we don't actually have any public housing. Uh, instead, we own and operate around 2,000 mixed income housing units around the county. Um, we are not the same as the Department of Housing and Community Development, which is part of the county government. Um, and I would guess if you've tuned in others of these, you'll have heard from them. Um, the Department of Housing operates the county's moderate income housing unit program and uh, other programs that also relate to housing. Uh, we're going to run through a series of slides with a PowerPoint presentation, um, and we'll be looking for questions and take them at the end. Uh, happy to answer them then. Um, so, uh, what is affordable housing? Um, we're talking about rental housing today. Sometimes there are affordable housing programs that also go for home ownership, um, but this is particularly about rental housing. Um, Unfortunately, uh, affordable housing is a bit of a mess as a term. There's no single definition. Um, it's often defined in terms of uh, how much people make, what's their income compared to the area median income. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, in general, uh, uh, tonight we'll be talking about it as three different types of housing. Um, one is housing that has lower rents uh, that are reserved for people with lower incomes. A uh, second is what we think of as subsidized rents, and that's the Housing Choice Voucher Program or Section 8. And the last one that is often uh, talked about as affordable is public housing, um, of which we have none in Howard County, as I mentioned. Um, so I'm going to run through those three a little bit first, and then we'll hear from uh, Donna, who will talk a little bit more about this category, the, the housing that the, that the Commission owns that has lower rents for people. Mr. Tucker will be talking about um, the Housing Choice Voucher Program and how that operates and works as well. So housing with lower rents, uh, which are reserved for people with lower incomes, generally um, that's available for people earning between about 30% of the area median and 60% of the area median. Much more of it is uh, uh, produced for people at the top of that range, closer to 60% of the area median. Um, and we'll, I'll got a, we have a slide that shows what those numbers are coming up. The area median income uh, for the Baltimore metropolitan area, which is what Howard County is part of, is $104,000 uh, for a family of four. And that is quite high. Nationally, the area median income for a family of four is about $68,000. Uh, there are a few jurisdictions, including Washington, D.C., where that um, median is higher, but not very many. Uh, so the Baltimore area is quite high. Um, so how do these work? 
generally the idea is that the government helps build or pay for um, the property. So if we, the Howard, the Howard County Housing Commission, want to get a buy a property and we would go to the government for support, they'll help pay for it, which basically means we can charge lower rents. Um, and so we th then would agree to set aside a certain amount of housing for people at lower incomes. Um, there are a bunch of different programs. You may have heard of some of these uh, that do this. It's, it's really an alphabet soup. The primary one right now is something called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. And that's actually a federal tax credit. So people who buy the credit just write that directly off their federal taxes. Um, but it's operated by the state of Maryland. Uh, then there are all these state programs. These are real things. PRHP, RHPP, RHF, RHW, tax exempt. All right, well, RFOHOPP, et cetera. That's not a real thing. I made it up. Um, but given all of the other possible alphabet soup of programs out there, it's, it would seem to be possible. Um, and uh, all of these fund slightly differently uh, affordable housing, again, primarily for people towards the 60% of median uh, income level. Um, there's also in this category, what we would put as, as the county's moderate income housing units. Um, I think there may be more information on that in other sessions. Uh, but the way that program generally is meant to work is that for uh, parts of the county and some many, um, many properties, if somebody builds uh, new rental housing, they have to set aside some portion of that, usually 10 or 15 percent uh, for uh, lower at lower income levels. Um, and there's not a lot of that being built at this point in time, but uh, there has been at other times and hopefully again in the future. So whenever new housing is built, the idea of that program is you get some affordable housing along with it. There are about, about 2,500 um, of these more affordable units around the county, um, most of them in the uh, eastern third of the county, uh, where most of the multifamily rental housing apartments are. Um, and uh, these are the incomes that, uh, I'm sorry, these are the rents that then go with those incomes. So uh, it, what does it mean to be affordable? So I just put up a couple of the possibilities here. So if you're at 50% of the area median income, the second column shows the rents uh, for an efficiency, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedroom, and the 60% rents are a little bit higher. Um, and this is what you should be paying in order to be in one of these units, a maximum you would pay for both your rent and utilities if you are uh, in one of these units. And for many people, this still isn't affordable. Um, but it's what we have and what the government supports in the way of affordable housing. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the need for affordable housing and why uh, this may be inadequate uh, in, a, in a little bit. Subsidized rents or the Housing Choice Voucher Program and other programs is a different category, as I mentioned at the very beginning. These are generally available for households earning less than 30% of the area median income. Um, there, there are some exceptions there, it can be higher, but it's usually 30% of the area median income. Um, and the way the voucher program typically works, and Sam will talk a little bit more about this, is that the voucher pays a portion of the rent in private sector housing, uh, which means if you have a voucher, you can go pretty much anywhere with it. Um, it's not accepted everywhere. In Howard County, you have to accept it. In the state of Maryland, you pretty much have to accept it now. But in theory, you could take this voucher to Hawaii uh, if you could get it to, if it'll be affordable there and work. Um, it's good anywhere in the United States. The voucher program is almost all federally funded or subsidized renting programs are almost all federally funded. There's a small amount of county money that funds some uh, subsidized rents, but not much. Um, and so it depends each year on the federal budget. Uh, and it's been pretty steady, but uh, it has to be appropriated every year. And then the Howard County Housing Commission, that's us, uh, runs the program with these federal funds. Uh, there's no real county money or state money uh, that we administer as part of that program. And generally, the tenant pays 30% of their income for rent and utilities, uh, and the voucher pays the rest up to a maximum program amount. Uh, and then I did mention public housing, and just to run through what that is real quickly again, that also typically is available for people earning 30% of the area median or less. Again, some places it can be higher. There are some ways it can be higher. 
uh, and it's housing that's owned and operated by housing authorities. Um, and it's what people used to think of as the projects. When people talked about the projects, often that was public housing. Uh, and in some places it got a very bad name. So a lot of public housing was torn down. You know, there were, there were uh, issues in Chicago and St. Louis, and you heard about it in Baltimore, frankly, there was a lot of public housing torn down. Um, although most public housing really is quite good quality uh, and is in great need. Um, it's disappearing around the country. There are other programs that fund better, and it really is a matter of what gets federal funding. Um, uh, so we're losing, I think, upwards of 100,000 public housing units around the country a year. Um, it is, however, possibly making a political comeback. Uh, the Biden administration has put out some stuff supporting public housing, and there are some others. Uh, and it really, I think, in my view, it is a real need and fills a real gap in, in the affordable housing world. Um, but uh, I don't know where that politics is going, so we'll see. Um, so I did want to talk briefly about who needs affordable housing uh, and the need level generally. Um, there are many more people uh, who need affordable housing than we can serve with either the hard units, the units we own that are reserved for people or that other nonprofit or for-profit developers own that are reserved for people of low income uh, or who have a voucher uh, can reach. So their need is much greater than the resources. Um, there's no buy right, as it's often called, um, uh, availability of housing. So you can't say I qualify for the program, so I'm entitled to it. Uh, unlike many other programs, you know, if you're really short of food, almost always you can go to a food pantry. And if you need a ride, Howard County has a ride service. Um, there are many programs like that that are available for everybody, but housing is not one of those. Um, and often, you know, we, uh, we see email from people saying, I need housing. I am uh, at risk of being homeless. I'm living with a relative, but I can't stay here or uh, I'm being evicted and I need a place to go, uh, or my family needs a place to go. And our answer, unfortunately, is, well, here are some places you can look, but we don't have anything for you, um, which is, uh, you know, unfortunate and, and very difficult uh, for us. But it's the case because there just are not resources uh, to go around. Um, in Howard County alone, there are over 5,000 households already living in the county who earn less than $50,000 a year who are paying too much for rent uh, or have other housing difficulties, um, which means that they're paying more than 30% of their income for rent, which means they have less money for food, less money for school supplies, less money for commuting, less money for medications and all the other things uh, people need. Um, so that's a, a, a bunch of people who are already stressed um, who live here today. And that doesn't include people who work in the county uh, but can't afford to live here um, and who would like to live here. Um, and just some other statistics, depending on what zip code you're in in Howard County, and so that you know define where the what the rents are in those areas, you need to earn between thirty and forty five dollars an hour, which is, translates to sixty to ninety thousand dollars a year to afford a standard two bedroom apartment. Uh, and we know that many people don't earn that levels, including often starting teachers. Um, other public servants, uh, people working in retail uh, businesses, uh, many of our essential workers, um, lots of other folks are not in that range. Um, for housing choice vouchers nationally, only about one in four of people who qualify, households who qualify, actually receive any federal assistance. Um, so you can imagine then that the waiting lists uh, for people who are looking for that housing are very long and um, around the country, many waiting lists for housing choice vouchers are closed um, because it, it takes so long to get through that list as it is. So what incomes um, are necessary to qualify for affordable housing? I've been talking about the area median income. I wanna elaborate a little bit on that. Um, if you remember back to your middle school math, or perhaps it was elementary school, I don't quite know when everybody learned it, but median is not the average. So um, the median is, is when half the people earn more than that number and half the people earn less than that number. Uh, so in Howard County, the median, as I mentioned, is about $104,000 for a family of four. 
Um, so if you look across at the family of four row here, 60% of the area median income, uh, and that 104 is the area median, is 62,000. That's basically 60% of $104,000. Um, and then to get to different family sizes, um, you multiply that for three people by 0.9, for two people by 0.8, et cetera. Uh, so there's an adjustment depending on how big your family is. Um, so this is what you would need to earn. If you want to qualify generally for section eight, you'd be in that uh, thousand choice voucher, you'd be in that 30% of area median income column. For much of the affordable housing, other types of affordable housing, you, you're in the 60% of area median or less. Um, and if you're qualifying for some of our housing or the MIHU, county's MIHU program, you'd be in the far right column, which is 60% of the Howard County median. The Howard County median is about $117,000, $118,000 a year. It's higher than the area median. So again, the 60% of those numbers are a little higher than the area median income. Uh, so that's that's um, what it takes. And I'm going to um, stop here on this part of it. Um, and turn it over to Donna Sturdivant to talk about uh, the housing that the commission owns. And again, I'll just make a quick reminder that if you have questions, feel free to enter those in the chat now, uh, and we'll answer them at the end, uh, or you can hold on to them and ask them through the chat at the end. Okay, Donna, it's all yours. They can't hear you if you're there. How about now? Ah, we gotcha. Better? Okay, great. Hello, everyone. I'm Donna Sturdivant, the Director of Asset Management with Howard County Housing Commission. So, what does that mean? Uh, it means that Howard County Housing Commission owns uh, well over 2,000 units throughout the county most of which are managed by third party uh, management companies and my department oversees those management companies that operates our communities for us. Next slide, please. So, one of the great things about our communities is that every community we have has a, a, at least 20% of our units that set aside for residents that are at least 20%, well, at least 20% of the units are set aside for residents earning at least 60% of Howard County area median. Um, there are primarily uh, affordable programs that are based on 50% to 60% of the area median income Howard or Howard County uh, median income. Peter went into uh, details earlier on what those are. Um, but we also have some communities that are for families that will pay 30% of their incomes in rent. Typically, or probably in all cases, that's attached to a voucher in some way. Um, and Sam Tucker would go into more detail about the voucher program, but often uh, residents would have a housing choice voucher or a voucher um, uh, from another area and they could go and rent one of the apartment communities and their rents are there. They usually pay 30% of their income. Um, at several of our, at our communities, we do have um, project based vouchers, which basically means that the resident can apply and based on whatever their income is, they would pay 30% of that in rent. Next slide, please. Um, throughout the county, we have family communities and we have several great senior communities. Um, most of our senior communities uh, are reserved for uh, residents 62 years or older. Um, the senior makeup is about 10% of um, the commission's portfolio, about 178 units. 
And these uh, senior communities, I always say, tend to be more fun and active at times than the, the family community. I guess you, when you're retired, you just know how to have fun. But um, oftentimes, you know, we have one of our senior community on here, Morningside Park, you know, you know, you go in and you visit and it's beautifully decorated for any holiday there is. And the seniors are usually the ones taking part in decorating the building and uh, organizing events and things like that. And, and that's the kind of things we want to see at our at all of our communities, but definitely at our senior communities. We want them active. We want um, the seniors to have a great quality of life, um, be entertained, have friends. So we try to have social uh, gathering places at our senior communities so they can come out of their homes and interact with one another, play bingo, puzzles, you know, a movie night, and just whatever um, activity uh, that would possibly be fun for them. So there is uh, the Overlook at Monarch Mills. Um, Monarch Mills is one of our um, family communities, uh, but it, it also is partly a senior community. Um, and there's a senior building with 45 apartments there. We also have Morningside Park, um, and we have Selborne, Dorsey, and Tiber Hudson. Next slide, please. So um, our family communities do make up the majority of what we have. Uh, we have about 1,922 units in our family community. I'm thinking we have about 17 uh, family communities. And with these, you know, I, you know, I raved about the seniors because they're so active and they put forth so much uh, effort in, in, in having fun and, and resident events. Um, but our family communities, they do vary. They vary in rents, they vary in amenities, they, they vary in location. And we have, I would say, a really good mix of family communities that are located throughout the county. And I'll tell you a bit about a few of them. We have Azure at Oxwood Square. Um, that's one of the newer communities that the commission purchased a few years back. And it's also one of the ones with the highest rents. And while you might find that, you know, some of the rents at this community can be well over $2,000, what I really like about it is there is an affordable uh, component of this. Um, that is the MIHU program, uh, which is operated by the county. And there are affordable uh, renters that are living within this community. And you go to the beautiful community and it's a mixed income community and it's just you know, a pleasure to see such a diverse group of people uh, living um, at this community. Uh, Monarch Mills is is one of our uh, very high profile uh, community that we're deeply proud of. Um, that community years ago, about nine to ten years ago, was a community community called Guilford Gardens. Um, this Guilford Gardens had some deferred maintenance issues, may have had some crime issues. Um, and it was just not a vibrant, um, you know, good sense of community type of uh, apartment community. So that was torn down and Monarch Mills was developed in its place. And it is a family community. And I mentioned uh, the Overlook that, that shares the land with it. And um, in that community, there's a fitness center there. Uh, play areas. It's a beautiful pool, and you you drive through this community, and you feel great about it because if you knew what it was ten years ago, and you there's this lovely mixed income community where again is a good example of you know you may find um, someone uh, living in an apartment that has a housing choice voucher, and then you may also have someone living in an apartment that pays seventeen hundred dollars rent. But as you, the apartments that they live in and the community you go in, it's just, you just see a good quality um, lifestyle and a great sense of community there. Um, in Ellicott City, we have Burgess 1 and 2. These are two communities that were built in uh, different phases, but you know, it's a great community because it offers so many different floor plans square footage, their townhomes, their garden communities. It's right near the uh, Roger Carter Center in Ellicott uh, Gardens. Um, 
Another community we have is Verona at Oakland Mills. Um, that particular community remains full and we enjoy having a community like this because the rents are so affordable. And we find that we can't have enough units like this because as soon as um, one, a unit uh, becomes available, someone's there just ready to rent it because the rents are very affordable. Um, next slide, please. Um, the, the, so we have our senior community, we have our family community, and we also have a wonderful supportive housing facility called Leola Dorsey. Um, the reason that this particular development is, is, is one of our proud uh, communities that we own is because there are 25 uh, efficiency apartments that are for residents that were previously chronically homeless. And they now live at this beautiful facility apartment building slash um, day resource center building. Um, the, the first floor of this building, there's a day resource center and that's open several, day, several days a week. And anyone that is part of the homeless population or just simply in need of services can go in, they can get food. They can get clothing. There's a hair salon. There, uh, there are usually sometimes doctors and nurses available for free health care. And there's also tons of great services, resume help, food stamp assistance. Um, sometimes there's even job placement, um, job placement assistance there. So, you know, this is a great oh. resource for the county. Um, oh, that's okay. And we, um, at most of our communities, we have um, great amenities and they can vary uh, based on the communities. We have some beautiful communities without uh, community space and without really any amenities. Um, and then we also have some communities that are filled with, with um, abundance of, of amenities. Um, you know, amenities can vary uh, based on you know, the community themselves, and it could be fitness center, uh, the clubhouse, some of them have business centers, um, pet play areas, pools, playgrounds, and, you know, just, you know, I would say any amenities that you might find in the typical apartment community uh, would probably be found at one of our apartment communities as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so I told you all about our beautiful apartment communities and earlier Peter uh, gave some insight in how uh, calculating the rents for our affordable apartments would, would work. And the rents for our communities really does vary based on that community. Um, they can start as low as 800 or if you are fortunate enough to become part of our waitlist for one of our project based um, voucher units, um, it can be based on your income. Um, and then, you know, some of our rents can be higher. We have some mixed use communities that the rents, you know, can be um, in excess of, of uh, $2,000 plus. Um, that's the great thing about our communities. Most of them, if not all of them are mixed income. And we enjoy the fact that, you know, someone earning $160,000 you know, paying, you know, 2000 plus in rents and someone um, that income, uh, you know, due to income might live with in an apartment with a voucher paying a few hundred can live at the, at the same community and enjoy the same lifestyle and amenities. Um, there are many ways to find affordable apartments um, owned by the commission and just throughout the county in general and throughout the state. If you're interested in one of the commission owned affordable apartments, those can be found on our website and that's um, househoward.org. Um, there are also a few other websites that's designated for affordable apartment searches. Um, one would be affordable housing online and that's at www.affordablehousingonline.com. And there's also um, marylandhousingsearch.org I think if you did a search, it would be mdhousingsearch.org at www.mdhousingsearch.org. But really, if you Google affordable housing, 
uh, in, in your web browsers, you would find that affordable housing can be at many other communities beyond what these sites would advertise. So um, just, you know, if you're interested in looking for one, these are designated sites, but I would recommend that you not limit your search. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do you apply? You, you know, you've heard about the rents, you've heard about the beautiful amenities, you've heard about all the great things that the commission has. How would you apply? Well, each apartment community uh, does have various different guidelines. Sometimes it's based on the programs that they have. Um, that's usually, I would say if it varies, it's usually based on that. And sometimes it, it could even be that that the guidelines are established by the companies that operate the apartment communities, and sometimes their guidelines can vary as well. So um, all of the guidelines do comply with federal, state, and local ha fair housing laws. It's best to contact each community directly and get additional information on what you should do to apply. It's important if you're interested in an affordable apartment to ask for one. Most communities that we own aren't just affordable. We do have a couple of communities that are all affordable, but most of them are mixed income. So if you go in and you ask about an apartment and there are only what's called market rate apartments available, then that would be an apartment that does not have any discounts attached to it because of affordability, you might be quoted a much higher rent. So it's really important to ask for an affordable apartment. Unfortunately, as Peter mentioned earlier, there is typically a wait list uh, for the affordable apartments, but you know, I would say these are things that is often worth the wait, but ask for them if you visit one of the communities. Um, you know, to, when you do apply, there are standard verifications that are going to occur. Your income and assets will be verified. A standard part of the application process is a credit check, a credit, uh, a rental history check, criminal background check. This is typical for just about anywhere you're going to apply. Documents that may be required from you would be proof of the social security number, a driver's license, birth certificates, um, passports, and other standard documents may be required when you apply for an apartment. So, you know, as you go out and you look for those affordable apartments, um, I wish you well. And if you ever have uh, questions that us asset management team at the commission can ever answer for you, please do feel, feel free to reach out to us. Okay, and that um, with that, we'll uh, move on to Sam Tucker to talk about the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam Tucker. and. Uh, I'm just going to get you to stand up and do a virtual stretch. We, we've been here for a minute. Just stretch out and stand up and stretch yourself because, you know, we we in the home stretch. Ready, ready to bring it in. So we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, Housing Choice Voucher Program, formerly known as Section 8. Uh, Section 8 kind of has a bad connotation to a lot of people. So the program was kind of reinvented uh, called the Housing Choice Voucher Program. And, um, you know, it, it, it does a lot of good things. So we don't want to have the negative perceptions of a uh, uh, of a name to be a problem with it. So we're going to talk a little bit about next slide, please. We're going to talk about the, the program, how it works, how it operates. Uh, it actually is a rental subsidy program that's funded by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and those funds come directly to the Housing Commission. You know, from HUD each month. Uh, on that program, tenants pay thirty percent of their household income for both the rent and utilities, and um, they can opt to pay a little more if you want to stay in a better neighborhood with better schools, um, better access to jobs, um, better neighborhoods, then you can pay a little more and be able to afford to live in those neighborhoods as well. Uh, we find that when families with uh, small children live in the better neighborhoods, go to better schools, they do better you know, in life. They, they get a better education. So some families, are it's worth it to them to pay that little bit of extra money to get into those better neighborhoods for better opportunities for the, for the next generation of kids. Um, once the family pays 30% of their household income, then the housing commission jumps in and pitches in and pays the balance to the landlord uh, up to a certain amount. 
which is determined either based on the amount of rent that the unit charges or the payment standard that is set for that unit. Now, payment standard is basically a subsidy standard that the Housing Commission uses to determine how much the maximum subsidy a family can receive. And for a household of two in, in this area in Columbia, that could range from between $1,500 to $1,900 per month. And that would be if the family had no income at all. So if you had a family that was getting $1,500 a month that had no income, and then you had a family that had that was earning $1,000 per month, 30% of that would be $300, which means then that family would only get $1,200 per month as rental assistance. Um, the payment standards are based on the household size for the family. It's also based on the unit size that the family selects and as well as the location of the unit. We have different rents uh, in the county for Columbia versus non Columbia. And we also have some special exception rent areas that we use higher rents than based on the uh, zip codes. The housing choice voucher program is protected uh, by Howard County, uh, has been protected by Howard County for over 20 years in terms of being uh, considered to be a protected class under the county's fair housing law. Uh, the state recently also adopted that as part of their fair, fair housing law, and it's been, been in effect uh, probably less than a year at this point on the state level, but the Howard, Howard County has um, been doing that for about 20 years. So if a family approaches a landlord uh, with a voucher, the landlord cannot say, I don't want to take your voucher because that would be considered discrimination. They would have to allow the family to apply. You know, they can run a credit check. Uh, they can run a, a, a rental history check to see that, that they're going to be a good tenant but they can't just turn them down just because they have a voucher. Next slide, please. The voucher is a three, three way relationship between the local housing authority, which the housing commission is considered to be the housing authority, the landlord and, and the family. So the landlord uh, and the family, their traditional agreement is called the lease. And everybody knows what a lease is. That's something that the tenant signs before they move into the unit. It tells the tenant what the rules and regulations are when the rent is due, you know, um, late fees, what kind of behavior is expected when you're in the unit. So that's that's the agreement between the owner and the family. The agreement between the family and the housing commission is the housing choice voucher. That voucher is given to the family, and on that voucher, they have different regulations that the family must abide by. They have to accurately report all their household income. Since the rent is based on the income, they have to accurately report that information to us. They can't uh, commit any kind of criminal activity, um, violent criminal activity or, or, or illegal drug activity. They have to respect their neighbors and abide by the lease. Any kind of major breach of the lease is considered to be a violation also of the program. So if a family fails to pay rent, then they can also lose their voucher for not paying rent. Or if the landlord has given them multiple warnings about a particular behavior, and they, they fail to correct that behavior and they are evicted, then the family can also lose their voucher if that happens as well. Uh, the relationship between the owner and the housing commission is, is the HAP contract. It's called the housing assistance payment contract. And that agreement uh, is between the landlord and housing commission and states uh, when the uh, subsidy will be starting for the family, uh, how much subsidy is going to be paid on behalf of the family. Um, also, it talks about what kind of condition the property has to be in. The owner has to maintain the property uh, just like they will with any other rental property. Uh, they have to make sure that everything's in working order. And if something is not working, then the owner can, uh, the rent can be abated for that unit if the owner doesn't take care of the property. Or eventually, we could also terminate the contract. So that's an important agreement between the Housing Commission and the owner. Next slide, please. There are several different types of vouchers. Uh, we have what we call HOPA vouchers, Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS. And those funds, uh, those vouchers are reserved for families that are HIV positive, who you know, have a family member that's HIV positive. It's administered, administered through the health department. You, know, you can go to their health department website and apply for that waiting list. And uh, once there's an opportunity for a unit to become available, then we would contact the health department and they would forward over a, a name of a family that's, that's HIV positive, and that family there would receive a voucher. Um, they, they operate just like a regular voucher. They're, they're seamless, except for the, that the uh, funding is reserved for those particular families, but otherwise, you would not know that it was any different program than a regular voucher. We also have mainstream vouchers for persons that are non-LA and have a disability. 
And those, there are several pots of money that are reserved for dis disabled families. And that's one type of uh, voucher for disabled family. We also have not a, a what we call a non elderly disabled disabled voucher, which does basically the same serve basically the same population. So because there are some families that are uh, some populations that are in greater need of housing, HUD sets for uh, reserve funding for the for those groups of people, and and so they get basically um, a reserve funding to ensure that people with disabilities are, are able to get into housing. You know, they're not able to work sometimes like people that are otherwise healthy. And so we have to make sure that we're looking out for, for that population as well as the elderly. There are some vouchers that are reserved for elderly families as well. We also have the bridge subsidy program, which is another program that receives state funding. Uh, and that also is for families with disabilities. The state uh, subsidizes those families for up to three years. And after that three years is over, the housing authority has to agree to give that family a voucher. So it's, that is a, um, a combination of programs where the state has gone in and, and set aside money to help those families. And the housing authority agrees that when that subsidy ends, uh, we know that that family will still continue to need a subsidy. And so we would reserve a voucher for that family. And then they would be transferred to a voucher at the end of three years. We also have home ownership vouchers um, that allows families with vouchers to be able to afford to purchase homes. Uh, it is a very difficult program uh, for us because of the cost of housing here in Howard County. But when we uh, use that program along with the moderate income housing program, then those units become affordable for our families and they can use a voucher to help purchase those units. There is a limitation on how long that subsidy can be paid. However, if the family uh, is getting a mortgage for 20 to 30 years, then they can only use a voucher for 15 years. And after that 15 year period ends, then they should be able to afford that that uh, those homeownership payments on their own. So if a family is, is working and earning money and their earnings are increasing over that time period, they should be able to afford to purchase a unit uh, for the balance of those 15 years. Also, uh, if they have equity in the property at that point, they can also, um, they can also refinance the property and, and lower their payments as well. We also have another program um, called, called the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. And that program is program to help families to become sufficient uh, without the voucher. Um, they don't have to leave the program when they when that time is up. It's a five to seven year program. And when that program ends, uh, hopefully they'll be able to afford to rent units on their own without a subsidy. Uh, but if they are not, then they are able to continue to uh, reside in the property. What happens is when the family comes into the program, their rent is basically frozen at a certain level. So if, say if a family is paying currently $200 in rent, and as they become uh, employed, they they start to pay five hundred, $700 for rent instead of 200. And that's a difference of $500. So what happens is that $500 gets put into an escrow account for them every month if they pay that to the landlord. And at the end of that five years, if they've met their goals, a lot of times that goal might be to go to get a degree or to get some advanced training with the employer that would enable them to earn more money. And so if they can show that they've met that goal after five years, then they're entitled to get the money from their escrow account. Uh, we've had families that had well over $20,000 in that account by the time they finished that program. So it is a very great program uh, for families. It, would, it can allow you to help pay down some debt if you have that. It allow you maybe to purchase a new vehicle or serve as a down payment for a home. So it's a very, very, very good program. Next slide, please. Howard County currently administers uh, about 975 vouchers that are awarded directly through from us, directly to us from HUD. In addition, there are about another 550 families that come to us from other jurisdictions. Since the vouchers can be used anywhere in the country, we have people that come, you know, from Hawaii, they come from New York, they come from Florida, you know, they come from Baltimore County, Baltimore City, and Arundel County. So they come from all over uh, here because. Um, Voucher allows them to, to uh, relocate to places of better opportunity. Howard County is considered to, to be an opportunity area, so it is an attractive place for people to move to uh, because of the schools and because of the amenities and, and, and just the reputation of the county. Um, because we only have 975 vouchers, um, we have a lot more families on a waiting list than that. So, um, the only time that we're able to really serve a family from a waiting list is when someone graduates in the program, um, when a person loses their voucher because they violated some kind of program rule, uh, when a voucher 
family is deceased or when HUD gives us new funding. Uh, we haven't received new funding from, for about probably 20 years now. So although that's possible, we don't see that that often. Uh, I do hear that this, the new administration is thinking about increasing voucher funding. So that would be a great thing where we'd be able to go to our waiting list and serve more families. But right now, the only way we can serve families is by the voucher turning over. So as a result of that, uh, we have voucher turnover of only about four to five units uh, every month. So that adds up to only about 60 slots per year that we can get from our, from our waiting list. So as you can, as you know, if the waiting list has, you know, five, six hundred, a thousand people on it, and you're only serving 60 people per year, that wait can get quite long. Uh, right now, our wait, our most recent wait is between uh, 10 to 11 years. So it is a very, very long wait. Next slide, please. Uh, historically, again, the, the list has been five to 10 years. It has grown over the years, uh, probably within the past uh, 10 years. It has grown significantly probably from about a five year wait to about a 10 year wait. Uh, there are certain preferences on the waitlist for families that that live or work in the county. In other words, if you live or work in Howard County, then you're going to get served before families that don't live or work here. Uh, we have a lot of families that apply here from other jurisdictions, but we would never serve them until we serve all of the Howard County residents which almost never happens. Uh, but if that family's on our waiting list and they move here and they're already on the waiting list, then at that point, they would be able to get a voucher, voucher even though they've been here. They just moved here maybe two or three years ago. If they've been on the list for 10 years, at that point, they would be eligible to get a voucher from Howard County. How people are able to move from other places to here again is because vouchers can be used anywhere in the country. So if somebody wants to move here, they get a voucher where they're living now and they can bring it to Howard County to use. Next slide, please. There are two ways to do waiting lists, or well, two primary ways. One would be by the date and time that a person applied for the voucher. Uh, and that, that method is, uh, or the second method would be uh, by lottery. Uh, the date and time, people think that think of that as more of a fair, fairness thing. You know, you apply first and then you serve first, you know, in the order that you apply. Um, Families know how long they're going to be on the list. If the list is running 10 years, you know you're going to be on the list for 10 years. If the list is five years, you know you're going to be on the list for five years. Uh, it sometimes works against elderly persons and disabled persons because they don't have the same access sometimes to apply uh, to get to a waiting list when the waiting list opens to be able to come and, and apply and, and be in that line. A lot of places, if you see across the country, you've seen many news events where people are open waiting lists and they have 10,000 people waiting to apply. And you can't expect an elderly family or a disabled family to sit out in that line for the, for the time. So they're at a disadvantage. So, uh, you know, a lottery system would work better for them. Uh, also, with date and time, if you have advanced knowledge that the waitlist is opening, then you have an advantage over people who don't know that it's opening. So it's not as fair as it really would seem on, at, on face value. The lottery, however, kind of is more of a, a equal thing. Everybody has equal access. Um, you can also have some set aside with that. You know, even if we have a lottery, we can also set aside, say, maybe 10% uh, of our units for homeless and serve that population. Um, it also helps families with children when they have the greatest need. If you have a child that's seven and you're on a, you put them on, you go on the waiting list for 10 years, they're 17 before they get a voucher. And, you know, uh, at that point in time, the family doesn't really need the voucher as much, you know, as they did when the child was seven. Uh, also, because Again, with children being in better neighborhoods, they perform better in schools. Um, and so if, if we're gonna help the next generation of, of families, then it's helpful to get that child into with a voucher into better neighborhoods, you know, while they're younger rather than waiting till they're 17 and, uh, and about, you know, they really have been formed at that point in time and, and they're ready to graduate. So a lottery, uh, again, when you first look at it, you think it, it may not be as fair, but when you look at all the factors, it really turns out to be a much fairer system. And right now we have a date and time system, but we're looking at possibly going to a lottery uh, sometime in the future. Next slide, please. So why should a landlord uh, participate with, with this voucher program? First and foremost, it's the law. You know, you're required to do that under the fair housing law. Uh, also, they can save on advertising costs. Uh, when the unit turns over, they can save, you know, don't have to advertise a the unit. They can minimize the amount of time between units because you always have voucher families that are interested in renting units. Uh, the program responds to changes in the family's household income. If they lose a job, then the subsidy will increase to take care of that. Uh, 
the payments are consistent. You know you're going to get them every month. You know, first first of the month you're going to get your voucher payment, and also it just it just helps a family in need. So it gives you a good feeling when you know that you've been able to help a family that really needs a subsidy. Next slide. And finally, um, in terms of landlord tenant law, the voucher program operates much the same way as a regular tenancy. Uh, the tenant pays for the security deposit. State law allows you to collect up to two months rent for a security deposit, and so you can collect up to two months rent from a voucher holder as long as you're asking for the same thing for a regular voucher, regular renter. You can't charge more for a voucher holder because they have a voucher, but they they will pay. They can pay up to two months rent for a security deposit. Uh, landlords should be fair, not nice. A lot of times, uh, you have to set the tone for families to know that they're expected to pay the rent on time. Uh, they're expected to abide by the lease. So. If they have, if they run into an issue, you want to be fair with them and and be understanding. But you do want, you don't want to be too nice because that sends a a, a signal sometimes that people can push the limits a lot of times. So um, as a landlord, you know, be firm but be nice. The land from as a landlord, you want to protect your investment. You want to go into the unit, uh, whether it's a voucher family or a regular market rate family. You want to go in to that unit after a period of time to see that the family's taking care of the unit uh, at least twice before. That first year of the tenancy is over, you should go in and see what's happening with your unit. It's an investment. Um, in terms of screening for families, we screen for eligibility, meaning that the family qualifies income wise. They don't have a criminal background or uh, of uh, violent criminal activity or drug abuse, not drug abuse, but uh, drug trafficking, anything like that. Uh, so we know that families meet those criteria, but we don't uh, screen families for suitability or we don't screen them for wonderfulness. You know, it's up to the landlord to determine how wonderful that family is going to be once they get into the unit. Uh, and so you have to do your due diligence with checking the credit and criminal history and, and uh, rental history of that tenant. In terms of evictions, uh, there's no special protections for voucher holders. Um, there's no special protections for non-payment of rent. You go through the same process uh, for evictions for, for voucher families as you do for regular market rate families. Late fees are the same provisions for families as well. Although you can only charge, uh, the state law says you can only charge 5% of the rent as a late fee. So you can only charge that 5% on the tenant's portion. You can't charge it on the housing authority's portion. So uh, in a nutshell, that is the voucher program. And um, I think now we're ready to move into the question and answer portion. Yes, we are. And I do have a couple of questions from the chat already that I want to answer and then if you have other questions you want to type them into the chat that would be great um so um there's a question from somebody who uh works on the transit system and says i see many people at a different intersections asking for money um are they taken into account for housing assistance or do they stay in places like extended stay um and, uh, you know, Donna talked a little bit about the old Dorsey Center, which is a, a development we have that was for, is for people who are otherwise homeless, but there still is a homeless population in Howard County. Um, and some of those folks um, are living with friends or relatives. Some of them are in tents in the woods. Uh, right now with the COVID um, uh, virus and federal assistance that was around for that, the county was able to help a lot of those people into motel rooms, at least for the time being. Um, but there still is certainly nationwide and Howard County is no exception, a, a problem for uh, with with homeless folks. Um, you know, most people who are homeless are temporarily homeless. They sort of have a problem, a health, unexpected health issue or bill. Um, and they're homeless for a while and they become rehoused. There is also a, a portion of the population is chronically homeless and uh, homeless for a long time and um, they can be more difficult to serve. So I think um, most people who are not really knowledgeable in the matter think that homelessness is really a result of lack of affordable housing again, primarily. Um, and so if there were more resources for more affordable housing, particularly I think with uh, Sam's program and the housing choice vouchers, uh, we would be able to get most anybody who really could be housed uh, into permanent housing. Um, also, we got asked, uh, Sam, you got asked, is the, are the special purpose vouchers 
separate from the housing choice voucher supply? You know, do you need to apply for them separately or how would how would you apply for those versus, you know, say a mainstream voucher versus the regular program? Most, uh, most special uh, vouchers come from our regular waiting list. Um, there are some rare exceptions when we would open the waiting list to take uh, additional persons. When we got mainstream vouchers, we didn't have uh, enough people on our regular waiting list to use all the, utilize all those vouchers, so we had to open the waiting list for that population to apply. But mo for the most part, we take those vouchers directly from our current waiting list for the special programs. Um, and back quickly to the homeless issue, I'll mention that uh, uh, Kim has posted the um, contact information for Grassroots, uh, which is the county's um, intake entity for uh, for uh, people who may be homeless or be in imminent need of, of housing or just fearing homelessness. Uh, so their number and, and website are posted. They run a, the number is uh, a 24 hour um, phone service, so you can always talk to somebody there. Um, I don't think I'm seeing any other questions. Uh, I just will mention a couple other things quickly. Um, uh, for as Donna mentioned, um, unfortunately, we have a waiting list for most of our properties uh, for the affordable portion and even um, these days often for pieces not um, literally affordable, not set aside for people with lower incomes, um, but it's always worth calling. Uh, again, we sort of have a, a system that is individual properties, so there's no way to apply for one uh, in one application for all properties. You should look for the one you're interested in and call that property. Um, and then real briefly, I want to talk about fair housing. Um, uh, we mentioned this a couple of times. Um, and um, Fair housing is a is a uh, both a there's a federal fair housing law, a state fair housing law, and a county fair housing law. And essentially, what that says is is that um, you can't be discriminated against if you're applying for housing on the basis of your race, uh, gender, um, your family composition, really meaning if you have children, um, and a number of other categories. Uh, and this is always a little difficult to enforce. So if you feel that that is the case, um, the county, um, uh, I've lost the county and office of consumer affairs has a landlord tenant group and a fair housing group, and, uh, you should reach out to them. Um, uh, and as Sam was mentioning, it's also the case that if you have a voucher, at least in the state of Maryland, they can't turn you down just because your uh, way to pay for the rent is through the voucher. That's not true in most states. Um, somebody could say, I just don't accept vouchers. Uh, but for Maryland, it's, it's not the case. Um, so there's another question here. Um, does one have to be employed uh, for the home ownership voucher? Or can other income be accepted? Yes. If, if in order to, to qualify for the home ownership voucher, you have to be employed Unless you have a disability, uh, then you can, you, there's an exception for families with disabilities. Um, but you have to be employed and in order to qualify since the voucher only covers your mortgage for 15 up to 15 years. You have to have some other source of income to be able to continue to pay that mortgage uh, when it when the voucher expires. And also, because home prices are so high here in the county, you really have to earn probably almost about. Well, for the most part, we find people have earned close to fifty thousand dollars in order to really be able to make that program work for them. So, but for as far as the federal government is concerned, you have to be employed for um, minimum wage for a thirty hour, at least thirty hours a week. Um, so then, one more question. This one near and dear to my heart: um, How can uh, how can someone advocate for more funding for the voucher program? Uh, and that unfortunately is through the federal government. So you should contact your federal, uh, you know, elected uh, House of Representatives from a representative or or senator, um, or all the way up through the president, uh, and let them know that the voucher program is important and um, should be funded at greater levels. Uh, you can also advocate for affordable housing at the county level. Contact your county council person. Um, 
you know, everybody is represented by an individual council member and they do vote on affordable housing matters uh, on a regular basis. And I think letting people know that um, affordable housing is a real issue in Howard County, even though we're a very wealthy county, it's a real issue for many people. Um, and we would encourage you to reach out and, and advocate for affordable housing among your elected representatives. Uh, I see we also have a posting for how to reach out to, um, if you feel like you've been discriminated against, how to reach out to the Office of Human Rights and Equity, which Kim points out is the right name of the office uh, uh, to go after. So thank you, Kim, for that. Um, and there's also in the chat ways to uh, find your uh, local representatives, both at the federal uh, and local level. I don't see any other questions at this time, and we are uh, right around eight o'clock. Um, so I just want to say thank you uh, for tuning in. Um, I want to thank Donna, uh, Sam, and Kim, um, and then also the county executive uh, Ball, who really pushes money matters. Um, it's an important uh, topic for him, uh, and I, I do want to thank him because I agree that it's uh, it's really valuable. The various sessions are really valuable for many people, and I hope uh, you're able to tune in on more of them. And so we thank him uh, and the county administration for helping put all of this together. Um, you can always reach out to the commission um, if you want to talk to us directly. Uh, our our website, our numbers and names are there, and ways to get a hold of us. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you again, and um, hope to see you at other Money Matters sessions.